Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vista. Thank you very much for getting up so early um, on a Saturday morning to be here. Uh, and I didn't expect, I thought it's women's tech talk and I wear girly, but I didn't know we have to hold this all the time. Sorry, <laughs> I don't have any pockets. So I, I talk with my hands, so this, I may drop this. Sorry, if, if, <laughs> if the sound wouldn't be so good. Uh, yeah, uh, I introduce myself a little bit. Um, I, I am born and raised in uh, Tehran, then I moved to Vienna. I studied computer science at Technical University. Um, then I went to California, studied computer music at Stanford University, and I worked at Stanford a couple of years uh, in au doing audio research. Um, and my background was first in HCI, and then uh, I moved it more, shifted it more towards audio engineering uh, because I have been um, playing uh, musical instruments um, since childhood, and then. I shifted it towards uh, electronic instruments and laptop instruments. So I guess some of you may get introduced to Arduino in the afternoon, then uh, if you want to build your own instruments, that is, that's a great uh, tool to start with. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is um, sonification of climate data. Uh, that's a project I'm working on at uh, Institute of Electronic Music and Acoustics in uh, Graz. Um, our partners are uh, Wegener Center of uh, Climate and Global Change. Uh, we get the data from there and from Max Planck Institute. Um, so I'm going to, I, I was not sure what uh, the audience is today. I thought mostly like beginners, computer science students, but I'm not sure. So I see a lot of experts here. So I, I should have maybe stepped up a little bit more technical. I, I, I just made a very overview, general overview about the project. Uh, and about sonification. Um, so I'm going to walk you through the research questions and then the methodology that I have been using so far and then the design approach that we usually use for, for a sonification project in this, um, in this uh, scale. Um, so why climate data? Because uh, climate data, we have huge amount of data we have multidimensional and multivariate data. Uh, we have measured data that is measured from all over the world uh, from even 200 years ago. Um, we have modeled data that is modeled by climate uh, science institutions. Um, and also it's urgent because we have to find other ways to um, solve this problem. So where we start with, some, what are some of our questions? We start with um, how do climate scientists analyze data? Um, then we try to find what are some of their visualization tools and software tools that they're using in their everyday workflow. And then how can we integrate audio into their work um, without um, interrupting it and also adding some value to it? We don't want to replace visualization, we want to enrich visualization. I emphasize on that because we have a lot of times conflict that visualization people think we, we want to replace it. There is, there is no replacement, it's, it's just an addition. It's good to have multi-model interfaces and then you can find patterns and features that you can't usually with, with visualization. So here I overwhelmed you a lot of with a lot of pictures. So um, I'm going to, instead of saying a picture is worth a thousand words, saying that sonification is worth a thousand pictures, Let's see if we succeed in that. We are at very early stages. I mean, visualization is a very, uh, has a lot, much longer history, but maybe not. Uh, let's see, how many of you know what sonification is? Oh, I forgot to bring those t-shirts. I, so, but. <laughs> how many of you know what sonification is? Yeah. <laughs> I have my advisor from my master thesis at TU here, so that's a little bit Awkward. So anybody else knows what sonification is besides Martin? No? Guess? Anything? Have ever heard of it? Yeah, go ahead. Like, What's your name? Uh, PR. Mm -hmm. um, I'm guessing it must be like a sound representation of something as opposed mm -hmm. to like a visual, you know, like you have the graph. Yeah. Instead it would be a sound to Yeah. Sound That's it. <laughs> okay. A t-shirt for her. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Here, let's see a couple of sonifications that you must have heard in your life. Oh, man. We don't have proper speakers here. I'm very sorry about that. So, everybody recognizes this or not? Yeah, nay? Nee? No? Okay. That's very imaginative. <laughs> Maybe I, I played again. Mm -hmm. That was just stethoscope, yeah. How about this one? T-shirts for these two ladies. <laughs> Are we running out of T-shirts? <laughs> I think she answered this one. Any idea? Mm -hmm. Geiger counter, yeah. Do we have more t-shirts? <laughs> so, um, we get to the definition, official definition of sonification, which is, to, um, is the non-speech, um, uh, to, to use non-speech audio to convey information. Um, so it's very important that it's non-speech, so if your Siri is not sonification or um, the um, nav navigation system in your car is not sonification because it speaks to you. So sonification does not include speech. Um, and uh, in the most, more recent years, um, sonification experts have tried to make it more systematically and uh, trying to have more reproducible sonification because um, Usually, they are very low-funded projects that you build some application, small application for yourself, and nobody ever uses it again. Um, so that's why sonification has not um, had a broader use. And we are trying to, to make more, more systematic sonifications that everybody can use and for, for different domain sciences. Um, the main thing is like um, that you try to translate the data from the domain science into the into the sound dimension, sound parameters. And then what is also very important in auditory display is that you have to take into account our auditory perception because um, it, there are a lot of things that you have to fine tune your application for. Uh, I speak a little bit about psychoacoustics and what are some of the characteristics of our auditory perception. Um, for example, one of the great things about using sonification for, uh, for uh, displaying data is that uh, it's uh, sound is also temporal. Like a lot of data that we have, for example, in climate science and astronomy, in most, of, most scientific data we get time series. So it's very useful because uh, sound is also temporal. Um, the other advantage is that we have, uh, uh, we can perceive a huge range of uh, frequencies. Um, I mean, 20 to 20 k hertz is very optimistic, but I, I definitely can't hear um, those very high frequencies. But um, it is kind of, it's a huge range at least. Um, Sound is omnidirectional, so you don't have to look at it. You can, you can hear sound from all over. You can have multidimensional sounds. You, you can walk into a space and hear sound. So uh, this is one of the advantages of using sound in, uh, in a display. Uh, the other great thing is you can hear parallel streams. So for example, you can hear uh, radio, and at the same time when your phone rings, you can still hear it. Um, so that's. That's great if you want to have um, to have a sound as a background and like have have for example um, sound to control something and giving you alarm and at the same time uh, doing another task. 
And as we talked earlier, we have visual information overload. That's also something that we can avoid with sonification. Um, so here, let's try a little bit. I mean, I have made some sounds that they were ambisonic, so they are made for three-dimensional space. And I thought we have two big speakers here. I didn't expect these. So <laughs> I'm not sure if you can hear um, the multidimensional sounds. So how many of you could hear more than one stream of sound? How many streams could you hear? Two? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and could you hear the directions? It's very hard with these speakers, I'm sorry. <laughs> so uh, th this was just a very quick sonification of east-west wind and north-south wind for, for one year in Greece. And um, it's, it, it doesn't change dramatically, but um, like you could hear the direction of the sound if, if we had better speakers, maybe. <laughs> but uh, I just wanted to show that you can use also the omnidirectional um, advantage of sound. But with sonification, oh, sorry. Um, let's, let's try another example, which is like, because we talked about visual information overload, so it's good to um, I, I guess you, all of you have also access to a lot of web data. Um, so we have huge amount of data that we need to analyze these days. So um, this is one of the ways to kind of um, make it easier to analyze data or also get, get an overview about any patterns in data. Here is a um, project uh, that um, that won the Pre-Ars Electronica two years ago. Um, it's the sonification of tweet data in Germany. Um, let's take a look. And here. I guess you got the whole gist of it, yeah. Um, and if, if you like to check it out, log into their website and also see different trends at different times of the day. It's very interesting because then you can hear different sounds and um, yeah. Uh, so, but what we have to be careful about when we do sonification is about our 
auditory drawbacks. So one of them is um, some sound parameters are not, um, ortho uh, are not orthogonal. For example, if you listen to two sounds uh, with the same volume, but the one that is higher pitch, you hear that louder, you, you perceive it louder. Um, also, we, we don't have, a, the, the people who are not used to listening to sounds, they, are, um, they can't hear small uh, microstructures in sound which, uh, I mean, you can get trained to that, but um, it, it's also a challenge. Um, and also memory plays also a role because, uh, for example, loudness is one of the parameters that it's not easy to remember. Um, so if, if you play in a band, uh, after a while you get used to a, a certain volume, then you don't notice that you're um, putting the volume higher and higher. Uh, so it's good to have a... a as you say in German, Pegelmesse, so <laughs> with you. <laughs> uh, the other problem is uh, fatigue. Uh, if, you, um, if you listen to sound for many hours at a time, um, it can get really, really frustrating. Um, unfortunately, we don't have ear lids like eyelids that we have. So if, if you have a, an application that goes on for three hours, you can get crazy if it's just sinusoids. So we have to be very careful about these uh, uh, drawbacks of our hearing sense um, when we are designing an auditory application. Um, in general, um, I have to tell you a little bit about theory of sonification. Um, there are you, you can put them in four different categories. One is audification um, that you heard at the beginning with that stethoscope. It's just like when, when you have a signal, you can just amplify it or you can just um, put it into a range that is hearable for human beings. So you are not really doing anything with the data. You're just making it hearable. That's audification. Um, the other thing that you have probably used all the time on your computer, you have your uh, all these little icons, they also make sound, um, and that's from 80s. They, um, the um, experts started building these, uh, designing these sounds for, for icons, so that's auditory icons. Um, and then um, model-based sonification is when you have a very complex uh, data set, uh, you want to kind of experiment with it, so you build your own sonic model which is not necessarily the same thing as, as the data model that you had. So like, it's kind of uh, building the, your own model to excite the model to see what happens to this model um, sonically. And then from that, you can draw results for your main application. Um, parameter mapping is something that we use very often because um, you can have up to um, 10 different parameters in, uh, in sound. Um, so it's not limited to three dimensions. Um, although, as, as we saw, like in parallel, it's hard to hear a lot of things, but um, if, if you find um, a fine spot to hear multiple streams at the same time, you can use several parameters, um, such as rhythm, because our, our, hear, our hearing sense is very good in finding rhythmic patterns um, if, if we get trained to it. Um, we, we are also very good in, in pitch uh, recognition uh, if we get trained to it. Uh, and also timbre. Timbre is a very complex uh, uh, field that you can kind of build your own timbre spaces with, with the sounds that you make and see um, and move in this space um, and, and use it for huge amount of data. Um, but let's first start with our user. Um, I, I'm going to walk you through uh, some steps that we have taken for this project uh, with the climate scientists that you see um, how, how the process of a sonification um, project works. How many of you have had HCI classes or, I don't know, no? Yeah, half of the people probably. Yeah, I see some HCI tutors here who, who wear my tutor back <laughs> then. So, yeah, you can't, you can't skip it. Um, yeah. So I guess some of you know about contextual inquiry. How many of you know about contextual inquiry? Okay. Nah, really? 
You don't raise hands? Only one? Only two? Okay. Um, yeah, because I just don't want to repeat. If, if you know about it, I don't want to talk about it. So I can skip some slides. No? Everybody wants to hear? Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, uh, contextual inquiry is when you go into your user's uh, workplace to see how, how they interact with their environment, with their system, and then that's what we do before building a sonification tool for them. So we want to see what are the tools they use, what are the visualization tools they use, how is their workflow, what we do, we observe them several weeks. Uh, we go to their workplace, we record their conversations, also focus groups when they are talking to each other because then they talk more scientifically. Um, we thought maybe they have a different vocabulary than we do. Um, and also we observe, like we ask them to, uh, to think loud. So they walk us through their process. Like for example, that's an hour of data analysis work that a climate scientist does. So we, we observe them while they're doing it, okay, what kind of applications they use, how do they use it, and then we analyze these, and then we start our design. Um, so this is a very general uh, workflow of a climate scientist. Most of them, they were gathering some sort of data, either they model data themselves, or they get measured data from Max Planck Institute, or other institutions, and then they, they check, they explore the data. That's the step that is very exciting because they, they keep on visualizing it, they, they check the data again, they, they explore it with another software. So um, that's, that's where it, we found it's interesting to put the auditory display in because that's for the exploration, that's where they can maybe find other, other patterns that they can't see in their plots. Um, yeah, with their visualization tools, we analyze the visualization tools they are using. We also try to see what are the tools that most of them use. And uh, that's why we built our system on top of one of the visualization tools that they use, that all of them use, because we thought that's, that's their go-to system, that's, that's what they always use. It's better to make use of that. Um, and then their metaphors, we were hoping that climate scientists have their own specific vocabulary uh, that we thought we can some, somehow connect to it sonically. Um, so, but we figured that they speak like any other scientists. Uh, they have their science words, like, like what you use for data analysis, a lot of uh, talking about simulation, about filtering data, about um, plotting data. So it wasn't anything very specific for climate scientists. But still, out of that, we found some words that we thought it's interesting also in uh, sound domain, um, like resolution, like filtering, like ensemble. But uh, we have to be very careful when we are correlating these words into our domain because, for example, noise in sound if you create a lot of electronic sound like we do, you like noise because you, you even desire making noisy sounds, but noise in climate data is something that they are, tr they are trying to get rid of. So we can't really correlate one to one, but there are some, some metaphoric language that we can hear find something in common. Um, so for example, I'm, I'm just explaining uh, in a very general way some of the experiments we do with them. We create a database of sound, and then we go to like 20 climate scientists, and uh, we, we do like one hour experiment with each of them, trying to ask them um, which of these sounds they like more, and then which of these uh, sounds they prefer to correlate to which uh, climate parameter. Um, I do like a simple version of that experiment a little bit with you now. So what do you think, oh, oh, maybe I turn this down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so can you associate that to any of these parameters? 
it's temperature, air humidity, precipitation, refractivity, radiation, geopotential height, pressure, and wind. Pressure, do you assign that to pressure? Okay, anybody else? Can you associate it to anything or not? And then what do you do when it gets warm? The snow melts? Yeah, let's try another example. So do you... Yeah, but do you associate it to precipitation or air humidity or neither one of them? Mm -hmm. Something else? Mm -hmm. Nothing? Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> you are not climate scientists. <laughs> uh, precipitation is uh, Niederschlag. Um, ref uh, which one? Which one? Ref refractivity is um, the amount of radiation um, that, sorry, refractivity is the amount of radiation that gets uh, into the uh, hemisphere and gets uh, refracted. Okay? okay, so you, that's the degree of refraction. Mm -hmm. um, and then radiation, you probably know that. That's solar radiation. Um, geopotential height is, uh, is the pressure, air pressure, uh, but calculated with height. So the higher you go, the pressure is lower. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> I have been so much into this project that I... I, I didn't even explain climate words for you, sorry. Um, so as, as most of you saw, it's pretty complex if you want to kind of metaphorically assign some, associate some sounds to specific uh, uh, parameters, right? Um, and, and the question is, a lot of times the question we have is do we just like go with our own synthetic sounds that we create uh, using sound synthesis, or should we use recorded sound and mani manipulate those um, using um, analytical uh, processes? And um, that's, I just, I just wanted to play a little bit, that, that to raise the questions for you as well. That's, that's one of the steps you have to take in order to see what are the suitable sounds for this application. And maybe after like doing two weeks of experiments, you come up with none of these sounds work for these scientists, for example, or we have to train these scientists another two weeks that they get used to listening to these sounds because they also have to learn how the polarity works with it or uh, the dynamics of the sound when it changes, if they can hear it, if, if the scaling works, if, because uh, if the sound doesn't have a big enough range, then you can't display uh, the data you want to display with it. Um, yeah, so I guess I talked about this. Yeah, some of, some of the things we, we experiment as well is magnitude estimation. So for example, we, we change the sound dynamically and we, we try to ask them to see like if, if this is getting warmer or colder for them or if, if it is having more radiation or lower radiation. Um, and uh, unfortunately for this, there is very little um, literature done. Uh, there is only for example for um, for magnitude, most of us know that higher frequencies sound smaller, like because like lower sounds are bigger, but not necessarily. Also, it depends. Like if you have a big drop of water, again, it's different. If if you are trying to represent precipitation, <laughs> so it's very tricky. So that's really depends on your application. That you have to experiment for every single sound before making decisions. Um, I thought we would have some time for live coding, but apparently it's very short. I, I got half an hour. So that's why I just like show you some excerpts from, from our application. 
so far um, you can kind of uh, visualize the data, but like just a slice of the data that you can sonify. Uh, here on, on these two visualizations, you see uh, one slice of 150 years of data. It's just one slice of it. Um, that um, they are in two different pressure levels. So one is the one on the left is very close to the, to the earth. The one on the right hand side is further up. Um, so the, the point for this was uh, we built uh, the tool that people can scan data very quickly. So if there is error in data, because there are a lot of measured data they get, uh, the climate scientists, they are uh, kind of, uh, they have a lot of, uh, not a number in them. There are a lot of missing data, uh, or some, sometimes they have data that is kind of totally wrong. It, it's very off. So um, it, it's from measurements that are very old. Um, so they want to sometimes just scan through the data to quickly see okay, if there is missing data somewhere and just throw that part of that chunk of the data away. Uh, so here on the left-hand side, what you can hear, and this one is the right-hand side. So it's a very quick, like within five seconds, you can hear 100 years of data. It's not very, it's not very, it doesn't sound fancy, but you can quickly scan data. If, if, you, if you're just looking for error. Um, the other application that we have already worked on is finding rhythmic patterns. Um, so when, when you have, like this, this one is for 85 years, um, around like, uh, it's a region bet between like these three longitudes and latitudes in these three different pressure levels. Um, so what was the point was to hear the temperature changes within these 85 years. So just listen to it, it's very short, like if, if you can hear a pattern. So, for example, this was very useful for some climate scientists that they could, they could hear like every nine years you have a pattern. So the, the warming of uh, the, the temperature changes every nine years a little bit. Um, I mean, if you want to just listen for a specific pattern and you want to make sure, instead of plotting it, you can much faster like use some oscillators to listen to it. Uh, we are a very long way from, from uh, getting the perfect sonification. I mean, there is no perfect, but to, to make it work for the climate scientists, but we are doing it step by step. Uh, one of the things that helps for sonification design is a sonification design map. Uh, it's built by Alberto Do Campo, and he did it by doing collaborative design with domain scientists and sonification experts. Um, so, by, by doing that, he gathered a whole bunch of data about different sonification tools. And um, so like having this map, it helps you, for example, to see like if you just want to um, just find some event-based sonification, you just want to hear for, listen to events, then, then you have like really a small number of uh, dimensions. So up to 16 dimensions, for example, uh, if, if you have, more dimensions, then, then you would better use model-based sonification because then it's, it's too hard to display it like this. Um, if, if you have a huge amount of data, you would better use parameter mapping. So this map is a, just a very general map, but it helps you to, to find your way to design your sonification. Um, our application so far has um, this NetCTF library that that is this visualization tool that all of these climate scientists use. Um, our application is in Scala, and then we have also a Scala Collider um, part that the audio experts, the sonification experts, can write scripts quickly uh, in order to um, test 
their sonification design. So we also organize small workshops for sonification experts and climate scientists that they sit together and work together in teams to see what works better for them, for, for their purpose. Um, and uh, also the goal is also to, to connect it with open sound control in order to have, um, to be able to write your sonification tool in different uh, audio languages like Super Collider or uh, Chuck, I mean, we use Scala Collider now, which is very similar to Super Collider. It, it has very small syntax uh, difference. Um, yeah, if, if you're interested in starting uh, audio programming, I really recommend you Super Collider or Chuck. Uh, it's, it's very easy to learn. If, if you are a developer, um, you learn it within a couple of uh, hours or days. Um, and you can learn really from s small making small sentences and then uh, going on from there. Uh, if you're interested, my students are having a, a concert this Wednesday in IEM. Um, they do multidimensional using ambisonics um, of the space in IEM Cube. Um, also, the first week of September, we have uh, installation in the Cube of, of a lot of our sonifications uh, of climate data. And then we have a month of media installation. We are collaborating with the Department of Architecture and they build us some uh, interfaces that people can sit on the interface or interact uh, tangibly with the data. So if you're interested, uh, check out our website or come to one of these events. Um, thanks for our volunteers for taking part in all the experiments. Thanks to organizers of this event. Um, the women tech makers, especially Karim for inviting me. And thank you all for listening. Um, and if you have any questions, please ask. And if it's too short, then we can also continue the conversation during the coffee breaks. Thanks.